Hi, I'm Professor Charlie Lees. I'm consultant gastroenterologist and researcher here in the Edinburgh IBD unit. My goal is to improve outcomes for people living with inflammatory bowel disease today. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more detail about our PREDICT study. We will link all the details down below. Remember, it's PREDICT with two Cs, so predict.co.uk, and at PREDICT will find us on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. PREDICT is the third key part of the overarching aim to reduce um, adverse outcomes in IBD by firstly, stratifying by risk, two, treating by biology, and third, preventing disease flares. Because we believe that third part, preventing disease flares, requires a deeper understanding of flares themselves, what makes them happen, when they occur, who's at risk, etc. So PREDICT is a big data study looking to address this aspect, with the hope that if we get this bit right, we reduce symptoms for the long term, we improve psychosocial well-being, and we decrease the very expensive physical, mental, um, and society aspects of um, disease flares with hospitalizations, surgical interventions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So with PREDICT, what we're doing is we're recruiting 3,500 people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in clinical remission. We then take a very detailed baseline survey of the microbiome, of lab markers, of clinical phenotypes, of diet, psychosocial, other li lifestyle aspects. And then we follow people over the course of 24 months minimum with monthly questionnaires to help us to pick up disease flares so that we can then compare and contrast those people who flare with those that don't based on their first baseline variables. So the overall aims of PREDICT you'll see on the screen in front of you are here, and they are to predict which aspects of diet, the genome, the microbiome, and lifestyle factors are associated with and predict disease flare in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, with the overall objectives of working out things like levels of fiber, levels of animal protein and diversity in the gut microbiome at baseline that predict and associate with disease flare. PREDICT is a big collaborative study that we absolutely could not do in isolation. At its core is the clinical trials unit in Edinburgh who helped manage the study. We've set up 48 sites in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland covering pediatrics and adult IBD because PREDICT is open to anyone from the ages of six and upwards. We have specific questionnaires for kids, for teenagers, as well as adults. No upper age limit because IBD doesn't get, go away when you go above a certain age. And so we have these baseline dietary and lifestyle environmental questionnaires that are delivered digitally. So what happens to an individual when they get recruited in the clinic is they're then able to go home with a log onto the system they log in and it takes them about an hour, maybe a little longer for people who've had disease for a longer period of time to address and understand all the different questionnaires. Um, and then once they're all submitted, they do the four day weighed food diary, a set of scales that we give them, digital scales that we got for four pounds off Amazon. And then they weigh each aspect of their food for four days, jot it down in a notebook, send the notebook to our dietary research team in Aberdeen. They give the patient a quick call, fill in a couple of gaps, and then that gets translated into a digital database for interrogation later. The samples are all done remotely. This makes our study very, very scalable and very friendly for patients. So once the four days of the food diary are up, the patient submits a stool sample, a poo sample that goes in two pots, one pot with a buffer for the microbiome, one pot that's not buffered, that allows us to look at fecal calprotectin, short chain fatty acids, and other metabolites of the gut microbiome. And the DNA sample, well, you can do DNA from a blood sample in the clinic, but we also do it from a salivary sample that patients produce at home, five minutes of saliva, spit into the tube, that goes off to the lab, and then Lee and his team at the CRF in Edinburgh will then process, log, 
all the samples, then extract the DNA from the saliva or blood and send that down to the Sanger Center for whole genome sequencing. And then the microbiome samples, those stool samples, we extract the DNA from the microbiome for metagenomic sequencing of the microbiome. And that unbuffered stool sample, we send through to the NHS lab where we've done all of our calprotectins using the same ELISA since 2005. So we have vast experience there. The team there extraordinarily produce about 2000 calprotectin results from across Edinburgh and the, and, and the central belt for clinical use. And they now do the calprotectins for predict as well, both at baseline and at flare. So we aggregate all of that data together and then we use that for the analysis. In the clinic, we have research nurses such as Kate in Edinburgh and many others around the UK that help patients recruit into the study. That process takes about 20 minutes. We ask patients to do it at a, base, at a routine clinic visit and there are posters everywhere as well as the banners and the social media adverts that we've run that allow patients to be familiar with what we're doing. And then we ask them a simple question. Has your disease been well controlled over the last one month? If they answer yes to that, and they meet the simple inclusion and exclusion criteria that you can see on your screen now, they're in. And then they get consented and we're off away with the study. We've been recruiting for PREDICT for about two years now. As with many of these studies, a slightly slow start, we get Edinburgh up and running, we set Scotland up, and then we open up more and more sites over England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. This is just, there's no way around it a time-consuming and expensive business with a lot of manpower that goes, quite a lot of red tape to enable us to get these sites up and running. And Lisa and team and Lauren have done an amazing job to get this really going. So now, with all these different sites, we recruit between 100 and 150 patients a month. As of February 2020, we have over 2,500 patients in the PREDICT study. A phenomenal achievement and a huge thanks to everyone that's been involved with that so far. But we do want, as a minimum, to get to 3,100. So I'd like to ask all the teams that are involved with the PREDICT study and anyone out there that can help to have a look on the screen in front of you, see if your hospital is listed as a site, go on to predict.co.uk, register your interest, and the team will get in touch. And we can then look at recruiting to the study for the last aspect. We should be done by May or June 2020 with our original goal. But if we do get more funding, we would like to go bigger because PREDICT with five, maybe even 10,000 patients would allow us to address hugely more questions. Because remember I said, IBD is phenomenally heterogeneous, that word. The variety of the disease is so different. Different people, different DNA different microbiomes, different disease phenotypes, different disease courses, different treatments, different stages of the disease. It's almost breathtaking to think about it, but it really does mean we need to aggregate as much data as we possibly can from as many patients. Let me tell you a little bit more about those questionnaires now. So here we have on your screen now a full list of the different questionnaires that we ask patients to address. You can see they address many different aspects from drug compliance, to quality of life on a couple of different measures, to looking at um, patients' travel and geography and work and professions, to look at studying, to look at exercise, to look at sleep, um, as well as a variety of different factors. We would like to expand the study to start measuring some of the thing these things directly. At the moment, we're just doing it based on questionnaires. But wouldn't it be great if instead of asking people about their sleep, we measure their sleep over time. Or instead of asking people how much they exercise, we use an Apple smartwatch or a Fitbit or just their phone to measure these things. Almost everyone today around the world has some kind of smartphone in their pocket. Almost a $1,000 supercomputer that is so powerful. So those are the next steps. We can integrate those different aspects into the base of the study. Start to get really techy with some digital health and digital tech innovations that will allow us to collect more data for these people. The dietary surveys are a really key part of what we're doing. Almost everyone, without exception, comes and sits in front of me in the clinic and says, doctor, okay, I understand that I've got Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, but what can I do to make things better? 
What should I eat? What should my diet consist of? Should I be vegetarian? Should I eat meat? Should I eat processed foods? Should I eat a particular type of diet? And, and the answer, the honest answer to that at the moment is we just don't know. So we tell people to probably follow something close to a Mediterranean diet with predominantly fresh, fresh food, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, um, meats and fish in low quantities, but keep it lean and keep it to, to once or twice or three times per week. And then good oils and fats so that patients avoid processed foods and probably food additives that may well be quite key to things as they go along. So we measure these things, as I said, by two measures, the food frequency questionnaire and the food diary. And together that gives our researchers lots of additional information. But I would like to work with people who are interested in digital apps for diet so that we can start to be a little more savvy about this. How do we collect 10,000 people's worth of dietary data and collect it in real time over not just one snapshot, but every month, every week, or once or twice a year? Can we do this with smartphone digital fixtures of food so that we can look at a plate and then work out exactly what's consisting of that? It must be possible. And I think some of that tech is being developed so we can add in machine learning and artificial intelligence to be really more high tech and savvy about it. For now, we get lots of nutrient information, lots of idea about different components of an individual's diet. And it will be very interesting later on this year when we start to match up the baseline dietary data and our sequencing from the microbiome to put that all together into one piece. But with apps, we'll be able to do this much more savvy over time. I just want to finish off this segment by talking about how Predict fits in with the other cohorts we're running. I mentioned Jem in another video. Jem is a study of 5,000 healthy first degree relatives of patients with Crohn's disease. It takes them at a young age, between six and 35 years of age. Jem is a study um, conceived and funded by the Canadian team of Ken Kreuteru in Mount Sinai in Toronto. And they've um, got together a number of researchers around the world, including us in the UK, to collect this big cohort of patients. And we're looking at their first part who develops Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So that's the very early phase, and we'll need other studies to look at disease onset. We have PREDICT that looks at disease flare. We will have PREDICT active and many other studies that are going on in the world now to look at treatment response. How does an, indi how does an individual fare when the treatment starts and we follow them into remission or not? And then we have some very big cohorts that we're generating across the piece to look at the whole disease course. So in Edinburgh, we have the Lothian IBD registry that allows us to look at population-based outcomes. In the UK, we have the IBD bioresource and now the HDR UK IBD hub called Gut Reaction that brings together all the different data assets from unstructured electronic healthcare records to imaging to digital pathology to match that with genomics. The bioresource itself has been phenomenally successful under the leadership and stewardship of Miles Parks from Cambridge and has already recruited a staggering 29,000 people across England and Scotland and Wales with inflammatory bowel disease into this genomic database that contains genetic and phenotype information and critically with patients consented for access to electronic health records and for recallability by genotype and phenotype. This is an incredible resource that's open up to all people, all researchers with, who are interested in IBD um, across the world, in fact, not just academic, but also um, from industry too. Again, all the details to how to link into that we'll put down below so you can get in touch or just get in touch with Miles directly. He's always delighted to hear about anyone that's involved. So PREDICT and the bioresource work hand in hand. And actually that's one of the things I'm very passionate about, which is trying to make sure that we have a relatively joined up global strategy. Um, organizations such as ECHO, the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization, um, the Crohn's and Colitis Organizations in, in the US and, and beyond are pivotal to helping us to understand how we can work together to address these key questions in parallel. So I'm gonna finish up that segment today. We'll just flash on the screen now the different URLs, um, the Twitter handles and the website so you can get in touch with us. 
Go and register your interest on the PREDICT website, PREDICT with two Cs, remember, predict.co.uk. You'll be able to get onto that to fill in a form if you're a patient or register for our newsletter if you're just interested in finding out what's going on. So for that, thanks very much. We'll see you on the other side. Goodbye.